Hello uh, and good afternoon. Well, that brief introduction to uh, John uh, D'Agostino only gives uh, a very small part of it. Uh, we should say he's been uh, the subject of several books, including Rigged, the true story of an Ivy League kid. That's him. He went to Oxford. He went to Harvard. Uh, uh, who changed the world of oil, uh, also the startup of you, and uh, a less uh, complimentary uh, profile in Asylum, uh, Inside the Rise and Ruin of the Global Oil Market. Uh, he is uh, also a lecturer at uh, MIT. John, welcome. Uh, great to see you. Thank you. you. On, uh, you describe yourself as a cynical enthusiast. I and do. You, and you've had a fantastic history in tech and investment. Just tell us more about it. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think I, I coined that term cynical enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm uh, years ago. I did a, um, I did a, a study with, um, for the U.S. Naval Academy on trying to uh, predict asset bubbles. The US Navy wants to know where there's gonna be asset bubbles because they are a leading indicator of financial instability. And what I learned in that study a long time ago um, was I'm really bad at predicting asset bubbles. It's really, really hard. But during those bubbly periods, um, innovation happens. Uh, patents filings go up by five times. And my takeaway at that time was a couple of things. One is it's very hard to predict things accurately. Uh, we are an inefficient species, humanity, at investing. We're really bad at it. We, we, we don't invent, we don't sit down and say, okay, we have the internet. We need a payments mechanism, we need a search engine. We throw a trillion dollars at a lot of dumb things and the result is Google, PayPal, and these amazing technologies that take us forward. So cynical enthusiasm to me is a realization of those inherent characteristics we have as investors. Um, many of you might have seen something called the Gartner hype cycle, which is describing how technologies start off in a, in a bubble, and then you have this thing called the trough of disillusionment, and then they always wind up in this beautiful curve up that means everything works out. Well, the reality is many technologies fail, many ideas fail. So, so cynical enthusiasm to me is just simply recognizing the incredible changes that are occurring, but understanding that it w around that is going to be a lot of nonsense that we have to try to avoid. So tell us how you broke the oil market. <laughs> so what they're referring to is um, a really uh, something I'm, I was honored to be a part of. I helped create uh, a partnership between the largest commodities exchange in the, in the U.S., in the world at that time, um, and the, the government of Dubai to build the first Middle Eastern-based derivatives exchange, which, which kind of sounds boring. But, but if you think about it, this notion of pricing crude oil using a capitalist principle back in 2009 was, was very innovative. And, and I give credit to the government of the UAE for, for being forward thinking in that way. Um, and it created an entirely new benchmark of crude oil, which is based on the type of crude oil that comes from this part of the world, which it should be. Before that, a price of crude oil was uh, referenced in terms of a, a type of crude oil that is usually not produced, light, sweet crude. And so it made no sense to me that the dominant crude oil benchmark should not be a crude oil that, that exists in the majority of the world that's coming out of this part of the world. So, so I, I mean, he, the author took some hyperbole in that state. I don't think we broke it. I think we iterated it and made it much better. And uh, it, also that other title, you, you changed the world of oil. I mean, yeah, I think we changed it. Yeah, how yeah, has it yeah. affected the oil price and, and the oil market? So I think it's, it, it's again, I, 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 I think innovation is iterative. I, I, we always think about this eureka moment that changes everything. In general, it's usually building on something that was previously there. Um, so what it did was it created an entirely new benchmark that companies in the Middle East can use to price their crude oil that, that it emanates from here. So I remember uh, way back in the day when we took uh, the leaders from the UAE and they came to New York. And what, what, what wasn't lost on them, they were very smart people, was that anywhere you went in the world, you can be in rural China, and you turn on the TV and they talk about a barrel of crude oil is $82 a barrel. That price, that information was coming from New York City. That gives New York City power. That's what a financial center is. And I remember them thinking, we, we want this price to come from us. We want the world to reference 
the price information that comes out of our country, out of our home. And so I, I think they understood the power of that. Financial centers are about where people meet to conduct business. They're also about where information emanates from. In, uh, you know, after, after um, uh, in New York, the f when, whenever there's a catastrophe in New York City, the first businesses that the government wants opened are the mercantile exchange, where oil prices come from, and the stock exchange, where stock prices come from. Exchanges are incredibly powerful entities. Without them, capital just grinds to a halt because you have no pricing information. And what, what about the impact here, world's biggest oil producer? What, what well, I know that there was an announcement that Saudi Aramco was, was referencing the Omani crude oil price coming out of Dubai at one point. So, again, it's just, it, you don't have to do anything, but you have optionality now to reference a crude oil price that is based on the type of crude that comes from this part of the world. And to me, that seems reasonable and fair. And now you've gone on completely new technology, yes. but, 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 but at Coinbase. I mean, yes. Did you see cryptocurrency coming? Of course, I predicted the whole thing. No, no, I, I, I am, I mean, uh, Tim Draper was talking about crowdfunding. I am on record. You, you were kind enough to reference Oxford. You, if you go, there's a course at Oxford in financial innovation seven years ago where I filmed, I was filmed saying that I thought crowdfunding was the dumbest idea ever. It was never going to work. Who on earth would finance a startup and not get debtor equity in return? That's stupid. I was entirely wrong. So my, uh, back to my original point, predicting things is hard. Now, what I do know a bit about is the power of exchanges and price discovery. And so uh, Coinbase had reached out to me uh, many years ago, some years ago, um, to help them think about how to grow as an exchange the way I helped the NYMEX grow. And, um, you know, Coinbase, I, I think it, there's, very, there's very similar parallels uh, in that the you know, um, commodity derivatives were this sort of esoteric thing that were really, you know, people thought it was really complicated, um, but it served an essential function. It created price information for uh, crude oil, natural gas, these essential commodities. I believe over time, cryptocurrencies will become uh, essential to global economies, and whoever is the pricing discovery mechanism, uh, and I hope it's Coinbase, uh, will be a very important institution. I mean, how, how transformative do you think it is going to be? We've even got the Bank of England talking about... Uh, I mean, if you factor in, if you consider, if some people in crypto don't consider CBDCs to be crypto, yeah, but if yeah. you do, as I do, consider them a part of the crypto ecosystem, you know, the, the question is timing, right? I, I heard Mr. Draper, and I'm not going to debate a billionaire. You know, he, he, he probably is right, I'm wrong. You know, he said 10 years. I, I mean, we'll see. But, but I think um, if you look at uh, uh, technologies like cryptocurrency, like ChatGPT, uh, generative AI, I, I think it's clear that they will have an important uh, impact on society and the economy. Uh, I don't know when. Um, but, uh, you know, to go from zero users to hundreds of millions of users in about three to five years, um, that's enormous. Uh, for, for Bitcoin, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was head of strategy for NYMEX. I helped create derivatives contracts. We'd sit in a room, we thought we were so smart, we'd sit in a room and map out this complex financial derivative and say, this is going to be really popular. And 99% failed. So when I hear people say, oh, Bitcoin, oh, what is it done? It has gone from an idea on a piece of paper, a white paper, to a financial instrument that hundreds of millions of people trade that has survived massive up and downs. It, as somebody whose job it was was to create liquidity in financial contracts, I would give my right arm to have created Bitcoin. It is an enormous success. Again, crypto people, purists might say it's not big enough. Contrarians might say uh, it's, it's too small. But from my perspective, it is a miracle at, at how it's grown in the, in the short time it's um, been around. I mean, a lot of people might say it's an environmental disaster. And not if you produce it using green energy. But uh, th that's not happening at the moment, is it, to uh, the right extent? I mean, I, I think most of the public Bitcoin miners are majority green, but, but you know, they can get better at that, and they will get better. But name me an industry that doesn't have that problem. So I think every industry has to consider that problem. I don't think... Uh, the question is what do you want to add to the problem? That, that's the but again, over time, as it, trans, as, it, as it inevitably has to transform into green energy production, um, that won't be an issue. What do you pick out? People talk about Industrial Revolution 4.0 and uh, uh, the fourth Industrial Revolution. What do you see as the really transforming technologies? 
Um, you know, I, I certainly think generative AI uh, as, as popularized by ChatGPT. I mean, so, so imagine if, if, if ChatGPT is the free thing you're getting on the internet, imagine the work they're doing behind the scenes, right? So it, it's, ChatGPT is, is wonderful. Um, I think of it as kind of a parlor trick, but it is, I think, showing you a tiny fraction of what's happening yeah, at, at the, we're at the academic Google's institutions. So, it as so it's, well, pretty, it's yeah. gonna be pretty extraordinary and transformative. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of its sort of societal transform transformative qualities in the short term. I think we'll see things like improved customer service relationships. Um, think about like um, those of you who use the uh, Amazon chatbot. Amazon chatbot is extraordinary. It, it, I haven't spoken to an Amazon representative in years. Why? Because it has a tremendous amount of training data. There are millions and millions of events every day. So the probability of your problem being new to Amazon's chatbot is extremely low. So what is ChatGP doing? doing? Its popularity is using all of us to train itself the way Amazon's chatbot. So by definition, it's going to get better. So I think you'll see dramatic improvements. Um, I think in cryptocurrencies, you'll see um, quiet improvements. You'll see improved settlement times for cross-border payments. You'll see improved uh, uh, derivations of human identity. Um, it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be the least sexy stuff, to be perfectly honest. It's going to be the boring stuff, the plumbing behind the scenes. Um, but that's incredible. I mean, I was born into a world that settlement for financial transactions took T plus five, T plus seven transaction plus five to seven days. Now we're down to T plus one to T plus three. To take that down to seconds or even minutes, um, you're talking about trillions of dollars of capital that are freed up. You're talking about a lubrication to the global economy that can't be underestimated. You're talking about billions of dollars in fees that can be removed from the world's most vulnerable people from people who need to send small amounts of money in remittances to support their families. If we can solve that problem of those you know, big fat intermediary fees, which I think crypto is our best chance to do so, um, it, it's really transformative. It, it might not be as, um, as exciting as, as Bitcoin going to two million. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I'm not, if I was good at predicting prices, I'd be on my island somewhere. Um, but I think the boring plumbing behind the scenes is where the really exciting stuff happens. You're, you're at Coinbase. How did you feel about what has happened at FTX? So, um, you know, it's a gentleman doesn't dance on the, the grave of his competitor. Um, it was horrific. Uh, a lot of people were hurt. Um, as an exchange purist, I never understood why everyone seemed to be okay with the same person owning a price discovery mechanism and a hedge fund that traded on that price discovery mechanism. I, I just, it just never made sense to me. Um, but uh, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna you know, be a, a Monday morning quarterback or a backseat driver. Yeah. Uh, I understand why people got excited as I, as I went back. We're not intelligent. I mean, you, you turned down a chance to work for them. Yeah. Uh, I did, I did. Um, but again, it's easy for me to, to, to pretend I knew everything. I, I, I did not know the extent. Um, I knew I was concerned about the governance element, yeah. uh, which is why I trust Coinbase, uh, because I believe in their leadership and I believe in their governance model. Um, but, um, you know, again, there's gonna, be, there's gonna be a lot of people claiming that they figured it out. Uh, I think I had, I, I, I think I sniffed out some problems because I'm an old guy who still thinks very pro pro prosaically about certain things. And if you are gonna own an exchange, you probably shouldn't own uh, personally a hedge fund, especially one domiciled in a very secretive place uh, with no transparency uh, that, that benefits from that, from that price discovery. So uh, I, I, I believe, you know, I work for a public company. We file uh, uh, re regulatory documents with SEC. We're audited by a very good auditor. Um, I think if you're doing complex things, that transparency is very important. So, so what is your advice to someone who's an investor who hasn't been in your world of cryptocurrency and the rest before, uh, Bitcoin? How do you, how do, what should they do? What should they think before they get yeah, involved? So I, look, I, th I think everybody, the, the, the basic thing everybody says is do your research. Um, I think that's fair. Uh, I think that's hard. I mean, we, I'm sure everyone here is intelligent enough to understand 
complex things like commodity derivatives or cryptocurrencies, but we don't all have the time to do that. That's not our expertise. You know, I'm, I'm probably smart enough to understand that amazing guy backstage and his robotics degree, but I'm never going to do it because I don't have the time to get there. Um, so I think uh, you do have to do some basic level of research, but I do believe in, in, in trusting verified institutions. I, again, I'm, I'm biased, but I think mm. trusting companies that have the courage to go public, like a Coinbase. People might have said that yeah. about Lehman Brothers. Uh, there's no guarantees. That's a uh, Madoff was SEC registered. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Uh, Diversification is obviously another basic core principle. Um, if you're if you don't have the time to do full research, then uh, invest amounts of money that you can afford to lose. That's always a sound economic principle. Uh, I'm not an investment advisor. Don't trust people's advice who aren't investment advisors uh, mm. like me. But I think basically diversification, um, taking the time if you're going to increase your exposure to learn more, developing relationships with people you trust who do have the time mm. to learn more. You know, find a quality advisor, um, and uh, focus on uh, allocating your resources to companies that have the courage to be transparent to you. I think that's reasonable advice. Now, sparing your blushes, you're a bit of a sportsman. You uh, rode at Oxford for Oxford, did, the second yeah. team. You yeah. played basketball for Harvard. Yeah. How do you feel about kids today spending hours in front of a screen? So I have two young daughters, nine and five, and I'm torn because if I, I'd like to just shut everything off, but if I do, I'm not preparing them for the world that they're gonna live in. So I do think there's a compromise. My daughters use, uh, you know, there's some great exhibits here. My daughters probably spend about 80% of their time when they're on devices using educational materials that are also entertaining. But I have to let them use Roblox. I have to let them use um, uh, 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 Minecraft and those things. Because if I, if I don't, I'm, I'm it, it would be like when I was a kid, my mother not letting me go. I grew up in Brooklyn. So she would, if she didn't let me go to the street corner or the local park to play basketball, I would have had no social life. My daughter is able, my daughter has friends who live in Uruguay and, and they're friends. I mean, she's not, they know each other. They know each other's likes and dislikes. Their friendships are no different from the ones I had playing basketball when I was nine years old. And so while I do want her to get outside and we go and we, we box together, that's what I do with my daughter. Um, we, we don't actually, I don't hit her. We, we, we just, we, 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 we play around and I teach her how to box. Um, but, but I have to appreciate that she will grow up in a world where if I deny her that exposure, I'm denying her the skills and the relationships that will make her successful in society. So I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't, have, I don't have it right by any means. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not the perfect dad. But, but I, I, I balance, I struggle with it. And the good news is we have so many resources. I mean, uh, I'll give them a free plug because I love them. My daughter uses an application called iXL. And we have a rule. If she wants 30 minutes of Roblox, she has to do 30 minutes of IXL, which are math and science and language problems. And she knows. She comes home and she wants to see her friends on Roblox and she jumps on IXL. And my daughter just got a certificate. She's done 50,000 math problems since she started when she was five. I didn't do 50,000 math problems when I was her age on, mm -hmm. on pen and paper. So, so it's, um, it's actually yeah. empowering. I, I do think I do, you have to be careful and you have to control it. Um, you know, there's, ap there's applications. I, I, my daughter's laptop is locked down. Her iPad's locked down. She can't, I, I get, since I've been on this trip, I've gotten five, will you approve this website yeah. uh, requests. So you have to be attentive, but that's no different from being a dad in the 1920s when you had to be attentive. So we have, uh, here, here's the bottom line. If, if, if I was, if the powers that be came down and said, John, here's the dice, you can roll them again and be born into any other time in human history, I think you'd have to be insane not to pick right now. With, with what we have and the resources, like I love being a father with all of this technology and all of this opportunity, um, as long as my daughter doesn't get cyberbullied because then you know, somebody's gonna get hurt. But <laughs> outside of that, it's great. And I, I just yeah. wonder, as someone who yeah. you know, has a base in America, knows Europe very well, and attends a lot of conferences and, and addresses people, yeah. what have you made of of, of leap of coming here. I mean, it, it, this is extraordinary. I, I haven't felt, in the West right now in America, there's this contest to see who could be the most pessimistic, and it's kind of getting me angry. Um, and I come here, and, and I, I haven't seen sizes like this and optimism like this, honestly, since my first trip to the UAE 15 years ago. So I, I, I am, feel so honored and lucky to be invited, uh, and it's just, it just gives me optimism, it gives me hope. And uh, the heavy, yeah. 
investment and focus on tech is yeah. the right way to go. There's no question. I mean, industrials are still important. We still need people. We still need bodies. Um, but, but this is the future. And I'd be remiss in my last 10 seconds not to say it's an honor to be interviewed by you. You're a legend. <laughs> and this is a bucket list item for me. So yeah. thank you. Thank <laughs> you.